As Elder Ballard noted earlier in this session, various cross-currents of our times have brought increasing public attention to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Lord told the ancients this Latter-day work would be a marvelous work and a wonder, and it is. But even as we invite one and all to examine closely the marvel of it, there is one thing we would not like anyone to wonder about. That is, whether or not we are Christians. By and large, any controversy in this matter has swirled around two doctrinal issues, our view of the Godhead and our belief in the principle of continuing revelation, leading to an open scriptural canon. In addressing this, we do not need to be apologists for our faith, but we would like not to be misunderstood. So with a desire to increase understanding and unequivocally declare our Christianity, I speak today on the first of those two doctrinal issues just mentioned. Our first and foremost article of faith in The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is we believe in God the Eternal Father and in His Son Jesus Christ and in the Holy Ghost. We believe these three divine persons constituting a single Godhead are united in purpose, in manner, in testimony, in mission. We believe them to be filled with the same godly sense of mercy and love, justice and grace, patience, forgiveness, and redemption. I think it's accurate to say we believe they are one in every significant and eternal aspect imaginable except believing them to be three persons combined in one substance, a Trinitarian notion never set forth in the scriptures because it is not true. Indeed, no less a source than the stalwart Harper's Bible Dictionary records that the formal doctrine of the Trinity, as it was defined by the great church councils of the fourth and fifth centuries, is not to be found in the New Testament. So any criticism that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints does not hold the contemporary Christian view of God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost is not a comment about our commitment to Christ, but rather a recognition, accurate, I might add, that our view of the Godhead breaks with post-New Testament Christian history and returns to the doctrine taught by Jesus himself. Now, a word about that post-New Testament history might be helpful. In the year 325 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea to address, among other things, the growing issue of God's alleged trinity in unity. What emerged from the heated contentions of churchmen, philosophers, and ecclesiastical dignitaries came to be known, after another 125 years and three more major councils, as the Nicene Creed with later reformulations such as the Athanasian Creed. These various evolutions and iterations of creeds and others to come over the centuries declared the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost to be abstract, absolute, transcendent, imminent, consubstantial, co-eternal, and unknowable, without body, parts, or passions, and dwelling outside space and time. In such creeds, all three members are separate persons, but they are a single being, the oft-noted mystery of the Trinity. They are three distinct persons, yet not three gods, but one. All three persons are incomprehensible, yet it is one God who is incomprehensible. Now we agree with our critics on at least that point that such a formulation for divinity is truly incomprehensible. <laughs> With such a confusing definition of God being imposed upon the Church, little wonder that a fourth-century monk cried out, Woe is me! They have 
taken my God away from me, and I know not whom to adore or to address. How are we to trust, love, worship, to say nothing of strive to be like one who is incomprehensible and unknowable? What of Jesus' prayer to his Father in heaven, that this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent? It is not our purpose to demean any person's belief nor the doctrine of any religion. We extend to all the same respect for their doctrine that we are asking for ours, that too is an article of our faith. But if one says we are not Christians because we do not hold a fourth or fifth century view of the Godhead, then what of those first Christian saints, many of whom were eyewitnesses of the living Christ, who did not hold such a view either? We declare it is self-evident from the scriptures that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are separate persons three divine beings, noting such unequivocal illustrations as the Savior's great intercessory prayer just mentioned, his baptism at the hands of John, the experience on the Mount of Transfiguration, and the martyrdom of Stephen, to name just four. With these New Testament sources and more ringing in our ears, it may be redundant to ask what Jesus meant when he said, The Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. On another occasion he said, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Of his antagonists he said, They have seen and hated both me and my Father. And there is, of course, that always deferential subordination to his Father that had Jesus say, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. My Father is greater than I. To whom was Jesus pleading so fervently all those years, including in such anguished cries as, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me?